I want to take about five minutes to recap and regroup a little bit. We looked at, or at least commented on, when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, it was about power and trying to confuse him about power and love, trying to get him focused on being a power machine when his mission wasn't the demonstration of power as much as the release and the demonstration of love. And we talked about that, the outstretched arm of love, the mighty hand at the end of the arm. The enemy was consistent in the life of Jesus. Later on in Matthew 16, when he gets hold of Peter's heart, and Peter says to Jesus, you know, you don't have to go to the cross. You've got the power. Paul has enough insight to say, well, actually, the cross is the power of God. So the enemy, once again, I see him constantly trying to confuse Jesus in his testings and his a variety of different things, just trying to get him off course of loving people trying to feed his ego and stuff like that. We moved into the Shema because the nature of the Shema being part of the law was that we love the Lord with all our heart, our mind, our soul, our might. So there's, there's a dimension of the Shema itself that talks about loving God with our might. And we define that basically as all that we have and all that we are. It's what we use to influence whatever. The thing is, Jesus knew it. He only quoted the Shema when he was asked about the law. And we talked about that as well, that he's, he's not getting rid of the law by any means. He made it clear he didn't come to get rid of the law. But he's doing what the law can't. He's demonstrating what the law can't. He's going beyond the law. In other words, you can't legislate love. Love must go beyond being a legal requirement from being from the law. It has to be relational, which is, I think, where John was coming from when he made sure we understood. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you in John 13, 34, and that's to love one another as I have loved you. This as I have loved you really turns the tables upside down. When you look at the Shema that says to love the Lord thy God, it's starting from you and it's vertical upwards to love God. So you better dig deep and whatever you got, you got to love God or love your neighbor as yourself. And we had made the comment that that can be a bit tricky because most of us in the room don't even know ourselves. And the self that we know, sometimes we don't really like or love very much. Or the way we love or like ourselves is not the best way and the best demonstration of what love is really about. So it's kind of, it's still a tough one. And Jesus knows that when he says to love one another as I, now he brings a different thing. He says, I've demonstrated to you, I've shown you what love looks like. You can see the works of love. You can see how I operate. That's one as I. Another as I is that he literally took on human form to love another human, demonstrating to us that the way people come into contact with and know the love of God is by knowing the love of the humans around them. Jesus says, as I, and is really saying a lot of different things. So from there, we went to Matthew 18, the unforgiving servant, because it's a great parable of the king demonstrating his forgiveness for a guy who couldn't possibly pay the debt that he owed. And David, you went and looked it up, and it was like billions of dollars. Yes. It was $7 billion. Yeah, it was a ridiculous figure. The point was not the, the amount of money. The point was that the debt was impossible to pay back. And that's the nature of man with God. That's what sin does, we'll put it that way, is that it's something that's impossible for us to work off or anything else. He says, have patience with me. Well, that's ridiculous. Patience isn't going to pay it. So the king just totally forgives him. He goes out and instead of forgiving someone who owes him money, that's a reasonable debt that could be paid back, he doesn't. So I jumped into that parable just because it's a perfect example of Jesus is saying, as I have loved you. In the parable, the servant does not forgive as he was forgiven. Now, Jesus is the one that calls forgiveness. At one point, remember when he forgives the paralytic on the mat, he says, your sins are forgiven, and everybody freaks out. And they're wanting to know, how can he forgive sins? And Jesus is the one who says, I'll heal him and get him to get up and walk and all that. The only reason I'm going to do this is to show you that I have the power to forgive. So he's the one that connects power with forgiveness. And if you've ever extended forgiveness, or if you've ever received forgiveness, you know what Jesus is talking about. It's very powerful. Unforgiveness is a huge problem. It's a huge problem for the one who decides to retain it. They do have a feeling of power. I haven't forgiven you yet. And the person who isn't forgiven, if you've ever sought forgiveness from someone and you felt like they were putting you in a position 
of not receiving it, you do feel like you're in a cage. You feel imprisoned. You feel bound. You feel bad. This whole thing about forgiveness was a demonstration. When he says, have patience, does anybody remember the first thing that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is what? Patient. That very first thing, love is patient. What I hear is I hear the guy before the king saying, will you love me? Will you love me enough to forgive me? Have patience with me. Love me. And the king does. He forgives it. And then he goes out and somebody says, the one that owes him money, says, have patience with me. The same exact words. You see, the problem with love your neighbor as you love yourself is I don't really see you as me. I don't see me in you. You're saying things to me that are exactly things that I've said and done and somehow I don't see it. There's a real problem with love your neighbor as yourself unless you've been switched on by God and you know what he's talking about, the way he loves you. And that's why Jesus says, you've got to know the way he loves you in order to see that self, that person, who you can actually love like God does and demonstrate that love to somebody else. Otherwise, we've got very twisted views of ourselves that go way back. And it's a problem unless we're restored. Last week, we were looking at that parable of the unforgiving servant, but it really came from Peter's question, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Which is a nice way of saying, when do I get to exercise my power and rights of retaliation? When do I get to smack the guy? <laughs> Seven times? So the whole parable came as a result of Jesus saying to Peter, you always forgive. We don't count. We don't keep any record of rights and wrongs. We just don't, we don't operate that way. You see, we think in terms of, you know, Peter had the keys, remember? And we think in terms of, well, the keys give you power, prestige, privilege, a whole bunch of P's, position. The message is use your power for your own benefit. That's why you've got it. You've got the power. The purpose of power is to exempt yourself from what power less people have to undergo. See, the whole message of power from the enemy, it has sunk into the hearts and minds of mankind is power is good for securing yourself. If you got the power, you can take care of yourself. Instead of saying, actually, if you understand the nature of power, which is love, you can free others. You can release that love. You want to know power? Release that love to see others that free. You see, Jesus is basically redefining power, our understanding and use of it. He's showing us the radical nature of a son. If you think of how many conferences, books, whatever, places you've been and read that talks about power in such a way that it's, it's kind of like this, ugh, it really it gets you all riled up. I don't know. I, I don't know what to say, how much to say. I just know that the heart of our Father is really wanting us, according to Jesus, to love one another. And this is a way that they'll know you're my disciple. There's the hook in there that I always see. If you go to the Last Supper and you take a look at the characters around the table, love one another wasn't the easiest thing in the world to do, really. But he's saying, but I'm not asking you to love one another as the, the way you are. I'm asking you to love one another as me the way I loved you. We're going to move into another parable. And I said last week, I'm not going to be picking on Peter, but Peter was a really good disciple to have around because he always asked the question or made the statement that gave Jesus the opportunity to say, no, Peter, no. He's always the one that's saying things like, you don't have to go to the cross because I don't understand the nature of love and power. And Jesus is the one who's saying, actually, that's a demonic thought. I've got to be honest with you. That's, that's really out of order. It's a demonic thought that's trying to keep me from releasing the ultimate love for the entire world at the cross and bring total restoration to all of mankind. And it requires me releasing my power in such a way that I empower the powerless. Who else is going to do it? Paul is switched on. Paul gets this stuff. But we're going to use Peter because there's enough places to just continue to help us, I hope, understand what Jesus was trying to redefine for us when it comes to power and love. We're just going to go to the very next chapter, Matthew 19. In order to get into the parable, I do want to read a couple of verses regarding the rich young ruler because it sets us up for the actual parable. We're still talking about power, but we're going to be switching gears from last week a little bit and taking a little different understanding in terms of power. But in chapter 19, would you read verses 16 and then just skip to 21 and 22? This is the encounter with the rich young ruler, the beginning and the end, basically. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Key word for us there, just so I don't lose you guys. He wants to have, H-A-V-E. What do I have to do that I might have? The things that we have, we normally...
normally call our possessions. So he wants eternal life as a possession. Why? Because possessions are power. With possessions, you can influence people. And that's really at the heart of where we're going tonight. The relationship between possessions, power, the whole thing. So what good thing must I do? that I might have, underscore that. Then you go down to verses 21 and 22. And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell thou what thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And so the word possessions is mentioned there. 